Okay, so here's the plan. In just a moment, I will call upon Paul Zisla to come up, and he will share a few stories about his dad. Paul and his wife, Debbie, came down all the way from the great city of Minneapolis. I even understand that you had a chance to get onto a local golf course, which is uh, amazing. <laughs> and following Paul's remarks, Bill Gitlin, a, a friend of Harold's and a Ziska family friend, of course, will conclude the gallery talk portion of our show. And then we'll be free to enjoy the artwork on display, have a glass of champagne or lemonade, perhaps, talk with Debbie and Paul and the Gitlins and the other folks who have lent their artwork. And we'll schmooze and we'll have some fun. So thank you again for your time and interest in coming out to the Federation on this beautiful day for the opening of the Harold Zisla Art Explorations. Paul, please, come on up. So uh, yesterday I was at Erskine Golf Course where my parents spent a lot of time and as I go in, the fellow says your name and I say Zisla and he looks at the computer thing and he says, any relationship to Harold Zisla? And I pause and say, I, you know, I don't know where this is going. I don't know how well you knew my father, those of you that did, but you know, this, yeah, that's true. Some things happen at Erskine Golf Course that we just aren't going to talk about today. <laughs> And so, you know, I thought about it for a while, and as you can see, you know, it's not just the, the uniform that identifies me as an attorney or the yellow legal pad. I'm not an artist. So those of you, a few lawyers in the audience, you know, that lawyer joke about how you frame an answer when you're not sure what the right answer is. And so I said, it depends. <laughs> and we'll send in these stories are told. It may still, yes, I am Harold and Doreen's. I am Doreen Zisla's son, and I also Harold's. But I want to emphasize, uh, you know, uh, I, I've talked to uh, Bill Gitlin, and um, poor Bill, he rode in the golf cart with my father at a lot of golf events, and uh, he's, he is coming back from that. I know a lot of you, just curiosity, uh, everybody, there are people here, did you all know my father, my mother? Okay, so uh, part of it, what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, my, we, we said cubism, and if there's anything about cubism, if you knew my dad, uh, multiple perspectives, different ways of looking at things. And so we all have our memories and our sense of my father. Mine is warped in a certain way, <laughs> being his son. Bill spent a lot of time with him. You have your own, and we'll share some of that. And um, I am, of course, uh, be my dad's guy. I'm going to vary the program a little, a lot. Uh, and, and we don't want to keep you here too long, but uh, Bill, I, I think, you're okay with Bill's going to talk some stuff about my dad's relationship to uh, something about the Jewish community. I'm going to come back to that theme and tell a little bit about my folks' history in South Bend, um, having come from Cleveland and in the background, because as Bill's going to point out, that did influence the art in some way. I will then, I have a few, uh, well, what we want to do is give you a better sense of my father, his life here, and, and maybe that will help inform the art in some manner. Uh, I often get asked, what is this stuff about? Well, you know, Obviously, lawyer, I can't explain it, but I, I get to fudge because I have my father's journals. And so those of you that have been wondering all this time, would Harold ever explain what he's doing? Well, he doesn't completely, but I picked up some quotes that might help uh, with the objective of somehow making sense of what uh, Marsha Brooks said. You, know, you can somewhat feel Harold's presence in some of this work. You know, his art was about it, uh, inner self to some extent, largely. And I hope I can help, but I, I'm going to fudge. I'm just going to read what he had to say. And not too much of it. You know, it gets boring, I'll stop. Uh, so that's kind of where the overall plan, it's a little deviation from what Mo suggested, but you know, I've been thinking about it on the drive down here. I guess that's what we're going to do, and we'll be mindful of the time. I, I should say, uh, Debbie Zissel is here, and, and Debbie, like my father, uh, was an excellent, still is an excellent teacher. She's one of the few people who would ever actually try to manage my father somewhat successfully, uh, other than my mother. And whenever my father was in trouble, we would turn to my mother for help. Uh, Debbie had great classroom management skills. And so if I get out of control, she will let me know. Uh, and so I won't. I won't channel my father that much. I won't get out of control because I do not want to get crosswise with her. So Bill, um, good luck. Have fun.
Thanks, Paul. Um, I think that Harold would find this deliciously ironic that I would speak today at an art opening. He might think it would be like me asking him to speak at a dental convention. <laughs> so out of respect for him and to him and his art, I'm going to try to restrict my comments to the Harold I came to know and love on a personal side. So Harold and Doreen were very good friends with Leslie's parents, my wife Leslie, who's back in the back. Uh, her parents, Bob and Pat Turbo, and some of you knew them also. And I first met the Zissos sometime around the time Leslie and I were dating in 1984. Harold found out that I like to golf, and the next thing I know is I'm waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning for a 4.30 tea time to play golf at Erskine Golf Course in the dark, at least the start of it. The 4.30 tea time didn't last that long, but the golfing experience with Harold did for over 30 years. We had more fun than was humanly possible at the crack of dawn, but every bit as importantly, almost every golf game was a class with Professor Zisla. The topics varied from sports to politics to religion to ethics to philosophy, literature, and even sometimes we talked about golf and art. The game was almost always followed by a trip to Harold's house for breakfast, and it was there that I first encountered Harold's studio. And for those of you that have had the opportunity to see it, you know it was the epitome of a serious working artist. And I'm not sure which outnumbered which, but in that studio it was a close contest trying to determine if there were more books than paintings and drawings or vice versa. There were so many of each that on more than one occasion I told Harold I thought he ought to get a hobby. <laughs> you can imagine what he said to that. Um, Doreen used to joke that they became really good friends with the UPS guys because of all the books that they would deliver on a regular basis. There was always a painting on Harold's easel in various states of completion, and his work was a reflection of his continuous study of most of the aforementioned subjects. Now, there are many of you in this room that could comment on the art far better than I, as I've already mentioned, so I won't attempt to do that. But I will say that throughout his lifetime of reading, studying, and teaching, his work continued to evolve until the day he was no longer able to paint. So I'll conclude by touching on a few observations I made about Harold after years of waking up and walking up and down the fairways at Erskine. There are three areas of Harold's life that I want to focus on. And the first and foremost was, of course, Doreen. Harold and Doreen were married <clears throat> for almost 70 years, and it was a true partnership in the traditional sense of the word. He would not or could not have been the Harold we came to know and love without Doreen having been there to support him. And I've told this story many times, and some of you have heard it probably many times. But when Harold was in his upper 80s, somebody asked him if he ever thought he would go into assisted living. And his answer was, hell, I've been in assisted living all my life. <laughs> Which, of course, we can attribute to Doreen. On an, one occasion, Doreen had taken ill to the point that she had to send Harold to Martin's to do grocery shopping. And when Doreen returned to Martin's, someone there who knew them said, don't ever send him back here again. <laughs> so there are many couples like this, but if you were to say Harold and Doreen, it was truly like saying one word run together. Religion. Harold, everybody's laughing already. Harold, not unlike many of us, had a complicated relationship with religion in general and Judaism in particular. He was born into an Orthodox family and was a bar mitzvah, but sometime after, shall we say, he became disenchanted with the whole idea of any organized religion and the concept of a deity worth paying homage to. He was greatly affected by the Holocaust and the idea that human beings were capable of inflicting that kind of misery on one another. 
Having said all that, though, I used to argue with him periodically that Harold, like it or not, was who he was partly because he was Jewish and everything that entails. And there is even some small representation of that in this show, including a piece that Leslie and I are fortunate enough to have that was painted sometime after the Israeli Six-Day War in 1967. It's hanging on the wall um, in the entrance. It's a large abstract painting of what appears to be a soldier with a helmet and a prayer shawl. Relationships. For those of the, you that knew Harold, you knew that he was always the life of the party. But beyond those superficial encounters, relationships were very important to him. The number of students who revered him, continued to visit him, counsel and learn from him well past his retirement from teaching are too numerous, too numerous to remember and speaks volumes about the impact he had on the lives of so many of them. Harold had a multitude of friends from all different walks of life. Four of them come to mind, and they are Lester Wolfson, Elmer Zedley, Howard Engel, and Father Richard McBrien. Howard is with us here today, front, not quite front row, um, and he could no doubt offer his own insights and a few stories, I'm sure. Um, but each one of them added a different perspective that helped round out Harold's non-artistic life. Elmer, in particular, was someone Harold met on the golf course. And even though they had little in common, Elmer was a professional truck driver. Harold was an academic, intellectual artist. Even though they had little in common off the course, there was an indescribable bond between them that generated more stories than I can repeat, especially in a, pub, a public setting. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what Harold would have thought about this opening and the show, and for sure my comments, but I'd like to think that deep down he would have been flattered to know that people in this community still cared about him and his work eight plus years after his death. Next year in June will be the 100th anniversary of Harold's birth. And it's fitting that we honor him and his legacy and also revisit his artistic life. So enjoy the work. I know that Leslie and I have been lucky enough to do so with some of it every day. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back to Paul, who will fill in all the blanks that I probably missed. Of course, Bill failed to say that one of Harold's best friends was Bill Gitlin. Uh, and what Bill also didn't say is those trips to my folks' house. He was, uh, he was their friend. He was also Doreen's dentist, primarily dentist. And something that I think, to me, it could only happen in a community like this, uh, dentists don't typically make house calls. But Bill would come by the house and uh, more than once, and he's, he's laughing. Uh, yeah. I don't know if he did this for the rest of you, and I don't mean to embarrass him and make you think you didn't get good service. But he would bring his little tool kit, you know, whatever was involved, and he would make an adjustment on Doreen's teeth. And if that didn't work, they'd go down to the office. Um, and, and to me, that does indicate the, the kind of community South Bend is and the kind of life my parents had here and why it was important in doing this show. Uh, I'll fill in. I, I, I'm not going to speak to my father's views on religion or organized religion, uh, but I will tell you, you know, a little bit about his background, what I heard as a kid growing up. Uh, he grew up on the east side of Cleveland, a place called Kinsman. In those days, it was Kinsman in Cleveland. And then when it got out in the nicer suburbs, it became Chagrin. And you know, that described my dad's neighborhood. It was a tough, uh, multi-ethnic neighborhood. Uh, my dad used to love talking about the, the barber shop on the first floor of his tenement building where the, you know, the mafia guys hung out. They would give him a nickel or a dime you know, to go buy some candy. Uh, the high school he went to was a, a pretty rugged place. And what you've all experienced, I experienced as a kid, as part of what Harold learned, uh, my father learned in dealing with that, was he used humor, right? He used humor to make his way in difficult places. He did that growing up. He did that in the Navy. He did that here. I, he was, you know, he could be a very funny guy anyways. And he used it as a skill. And he used it to engage with people, I think, to make them feel better. And I'll, I'll get to that in one of the three stories about that. So my parents grew up in a heavily Jewish community. 
Uh, they were, you know, Orthodox Jews in the family, and they, they so they knew this stuff. My father's view about religion was well informed. Uh, he did read a lot. Um, I do recall there was this, there were a few Bibles in the house. Amongst those books, there were 144 boxes of books uh, that we donated to IU South Bend, and about 90% of those were art books. One of them is a, a incredible Bible. It's Rembrandt. Uh, well, it's this huge Bible, massive. Why would my father have this? Well, there were beautiful prints of Rembrandt paintings uh, with biblical settings. Uh, you know, there are a lot of books about Rembrandt jumping ahead a little, which if you look at the art, it shouldn't shock you uh, that people's minds work this way. Not always very linear. Uh, the books, when we box the books, you know, Rembrandt, Cezanne, of course, Picasso, Gustin. Uh, you know, if you went by head count, those are the people he looked to. People often ask, who are the artistic influences? Well, those were some of them. And if you think about Rembrandt and portraiture, and then you think about the move to abstraction, you got to think about Cezanne. But I get off the thing. So, not entirely. So they moved to South Bend. Um, I lived in Mishawaka, and my mother, and, and, and I hope this is appropriate, she said she grew up in a community where it felt to her like at every corner there was a deli or a bakery, right? And she came to Mishawaka, and her first response was, it's felt like, and this isn't accurate, but it felt like there was a church on every corner. Uh, she was acutely aware at the time, you know, there was the Jewish community, this is in the 50s, the Jewish community, well-defined, and others. And, you know, she had to negotiate that at the time, and I think things have changed quite a bit, but they joined Temple, they formed friendships, some people here, your families, uh, parents, uh, and those friendships lasted till the end, and those names lasted till the end. You'll see a catalog of my dad's last retrospective, and you look at the donor list, you'll recognize the names. And what they did in terms of relationship, they kept those relationships that started with the temple, and they added on. Uh, they, it was nature of their personality, if you recall them. They could, both of them could charm people. Uh, they, were extrovert, they were the definition of extroverts. Uh, my dad came, he worked at the ball band. He was an industrial designer. Remember I mentioned you know, uh, cubism. He was, he was a good designer, and he was doing realistic work. He, he was at the ball band, and he called it the ball band. It's now a lovely park with restaurants and the like at that location. He winds up at the art center in 19, I don't know, mid-60s late 50s, early 60s. And at the art center, as my mother said, you know, it was a public facing kind of job. And so my dad would get to know a lot of people from a lot of, not just in the Jewish community, but throughout the town. And I think people liked him, he charmed them, he worked, very, you know, he worked hard, he helped build the art center, it's now the museum. Uh, one of the aspects of that, uh, and this is a little bit about his personality and the people he knew, and, and I won't try to describe more of his personality, your own reflections, but. Uh, he went out to, in those days, the two martini lunch was like a good starting point. And if you knew Harold, I mean, Harold, the two martinis at lunch could be just hysterical and just really funny. And it was, you know, at times you felt like you were in a Robin Williams stand-up routine when he would get going at home. And that's why I'm drinking a lot of water. If you've ever seen Robin Williams drink a lot of water during his routines. So he was out for like a two or three martini lunch with a guy named Bob O'Connor. And, you know, my dad was, it was, Sometime in the spring, and my father was giving Bob a rough time about Lent and giving up for Lent and challenging him about it. You know, why are you doing this? Ah, you're giving up easy stuff. And Bob said, no. He, gave, he mentioned what he had given up for Lent. It was something really serious and significant. And so Bob O'Connor, who I did not meet, but I heard a lot about, he challenged Harold. Um, and he really pushed him. And he said, well, you know, why don't you consider changing something or giving up something, you know, really making a commitment. Now, this is a guy who grew up in Cleveland started smoking maybe when he was either seven years old or seventh grade. Um, I, I, you know, this is about my father. He was actually a, a pretty good athlete. Short, but sh like, you know, not shocking what my height. Um, he's a short guy, but he, very coordinated, very skilled. Uh, he said he played basketball. He was clever, right? And so he's on, he made it to the basketball team when he was, I guess, ninth grade. So, but he got, he had, you know, you all think of him as charming and wonderful. He has, he could get in trouble. He got thrown off the basketball team in ninth grade because he got caught not just smoking outside of school, he got caught smoking at halftime in the locker room. <laughs> so Bob O'Connor, you know, this was a big thing, and my dad's, okay, I'll stop smoking cigarettes. And this was when in the 60s. 
He, he switched to a cigar, and unless some of you saw him in public and I don't know about this, didn't smoke cigarettes again. What's the point? Well, it was his commitment to things, his resolve, his um, discipline, uh, his focus, um, and also his somewhat you know, unpredictable behavior and unpredictable the things he would say. So that's the one story that really appeals to me. Uh, there's another one. I, I, I should talk a little bit, I, I don't know the timing for this, about the Jewish community and my mother's participation in the Jewish community. Uh, I, I haven't verified it, but it, it, one time I think the uh, South Bend Country Club, there were not many Jewish members in like the 50s and 60s. But my parents would get invited there because play golf, you know, my dad would start his day playing golf at Erskine, public golf course, and at the time, you know, that was the division in South Bend, the public courses, the other courses, and then get invited to the country club in the afternoon. And my mom would go out there because people really liked him. He could work in both worlds and relate to people in both worlds. Uh, and to me, that kind of suggested a little bit about their situation here. Uh, my mother, uh, they, they did join Temple and they formed friendships, they kept those. My mother made the comment uh, coming from the environment she did that at the time, you know, and I felt this, you know, you were Jewish, it was the community, and you, I kind of had a sense there was the other community. You know, you had, it took a while to make inroads. And maybe I'm wrong about this, but that's how I perceived it, that's how they perceived it, which has happened. And, and my father did that. Um, my mother made the comment about Temple, and she talked about this history in this wonderful video that uh, Barbara Welber uh, Asher uh, made of uh, interviews with women uh, in South Bend, and my mother talks about this, and she talks about how, you know, she always felt uh, Temple was an important part of the community. Uh, Jewish identity was important, even if they weren't religious Jews. Uh, my father never really ran from that aspect of it if you were around him. I mean, he, he had knowledge, he would use expressions. Um, my mother, it turns out, was, was bilingual. Uh, she was in a conversation with a woman, Israeli, was teaching Notre Dame and they're talking and my mom, I, I think this is true, 15 minutes later she realizes she's just speaking Yiddish. Uh, and my mom said, you know, Temple is an important part of this community. We support it over Harold's comments, but I think he went along with it. Um, they didn't really do anything that the other person didn't approve of ever. Uh, and, you know, until her, well, until her last days, I mean, the last set of checkbook, she would support Temple. And I, I want to talk about that when I wrap up uh, in terms of the artwork that's back there. Uh, Moshe asked me about it, I'll do it. So it's the one story, it's the you know, giving up cigarettes for Lent, this bad boy whom my uncle didn't want my mother to marry because he said, hey, he's a bum. Um, <laughs> he ran with bums, I mean, that was his thing, but you know, he was in many worlds and he could work in many worlds from you know, Erskine Park and the bums at Erskine Park like Bill Gitlin, which we all know isn't true, <laughs> and, uh, to you know, the South Bend Country Club and that crowd, and I think people liked him, he learned to charm people. Uh, the other story, and I'll pick up, Marsha Brooks uh, did a, a wonderful thing, an interview with WSBT, um, and uh, Marsha made a comment, you know, there's a, if you see, there's a fair amount of art here. Uh, this is like, just like a tiny bit. Uh, and there's all the art that's in homes of many of the people here, and if you look at the me and my Zisla thing, you'll see a lot more of it. The museum has more, IUSB has more. My father's pretty serious about doing artwork. I, I know the numbers, and then I didn't want to that was a little arrogant on my part to say it, but Debbie and I, as we were storing it, when my father died, we moved 580 panels. That's stuff like this, varying size. We, moved, we have about 580 of those in storage in Minnesota. Uh, we also, at, later on, moved about 5,000 watercolors. Paintings, uh, which type are they? Well, there's some out in the hallway, or this one right over here. Here, probably, is that type. Watercolors, drawings, portraits, if you see the pencil drawings. I do need to talk about portraiture. Uh, and we had, there are these kinds of things, sketchbooks. Um, my father had 110 or 115 of them. Each one has 100 pages. And he filled all of them. Uh, and then he went back through and he ripped out the ones he didn't like, signed the rest. Uh, each one has 100 pages times 110 or 115. You know, do the arithmetic, it's a lot of art. Uh, and then I think we have like, we count 6,700 of them are left. So the, anybody that was a student, when my dad would say, yeah, mileage was one of his expressions, work hard, I mean, that's what he did. So there was the public herald, there's a lot of fun, he's playing golf, but when he went to a studio to work, he worked. So a typical day, 
not on Saturdays, because Bill would come over and that would delay the festive, <laughs> delay things a little. It was a weekend. My mom and dad would go to Erskine, play golf. My, my mom was like three days a week. He was every day. And it didn't matter what the weather, it wasn't the circumstances. He just went. And on the weekends, you know, when he was younger, he would play younger, like under 80. He would play Saturday and Sunday. So that's a lot of golf. And then he'd come home, right? Come home and he'd, re he'd well, at first he'd get up and write in his journal. Then he'd go play golf because he was not a very good sleeper. I disclosed a lot about my dad. He was good at a lot of things, but sleeping was not one of them. So he'd get up and he'd write in his journal. Then he would go play golf. Then he'd come home, have breakfast, and he would paint and draw for a few hours, right? He would stop. He would read. He would read many of those art books and he would mark them up and underline them. He'd really pay attention and learn from them. Then he would have lunch, and depending on how he felt, he would either like sleep away the afternoon. He'd go back in the studio and start working more. So he just produced, you know, this is just some of the work. It's, I think, well curated, though. This is what he would consider the, the nice, the better work. He would do this, and Debbie and I are sorting this stuff, and we weren't all that thrilled with him. It was a lot of work, and I called my mother, who's a lovely person. No one ever said an unkind word. Well, I never heard an unkind word about her. I said, Dor, this is your fault. And by the way, we refer to her as Dora, my father is Hirsch, because, you know, Herschel. His mother called him Herschel. I don't know if it was used in the community, but that's how we referred to him. So, you know, um, Dora, and, uh, Her Dora, this is your fault. And my mother's taken aback. I mean, she's very sensitive. Uh, people that met her, kind, sweet, everybody loved Dora. And uh, you can't say, an, even to this day, you can't say, I feel bad if I say an unkind word about her. And I, you know, I don't think she is really paying attention anymore. But uh, I said, Dora, it's your fault. How's that possible? You know, it's your father who's the madman. I mean, all he does is come and produce this art. And it's art of a lot of variety. It's intent, right? It's intense. It's colorful. It's got a lot going on. This is not, you know, it's, it is, may not be for everybody, but, it, you know, it, it's not simple stuff. He didn't just crank, you know, oh, that took me two minutes, I'm done. It's th it, there's a lot of thought in it, artistic thought. And what would happen is it's your fault. And she said, how could that be? I said, because you only play nine holes. You really should have played 18. <laughs> I mean, you really need to tire. You, you got to stop this guy somehow. I, I think somehow if you put, if you put these sketchbooks together, they like something happens biologically, and they just produce more art because that's what he did. <laughs> so, in due respect, Marcia hit on when she said four thousand. It's like way beyond that. Uh, and so, you know, that was this that story. Then one last, do I have time? One more story about my father's personality. Uh, you see it reflected out there in some of the stuff, and then I'll start quoting him, which is a whole lot more interesting than me talking about him. Um, my last memory of, I think it's my last memory of my dad, except at the very, very end, and that's not a real pleasant memory. Um, no, it's kind of nothing. Is that I dropped him off at dialysis. He started dialysis uh, and didn't stick with it. And I, I'm convinced he didn't stick with it. He felt terrible, he was bored, he couldn't paint and draw, couldn't play golf, and being bored was just not <laughs> something my dad dealt with very well. I mean, you can tell that. And I dropped, and he was being cranky. You know, he wasn't feeling well, but he was also being kind of cranky, morose, withdrawn, not talking, his son, right? not talking to me. And there is always the private herald who could, you know, be not feeling well if someone, some of you or other people show up the door, boom. He, he came alive. I mean, it was just a ball. I guess that's my signal. <laughs> Debbie, you should have turned your phone. I told you to turn my phone. At any rate, and I don't want to keep you all too long. I mean, there'll be time. There's, it, it, I, I'll get to it. Um, yeah, his cell phone would be way beyond here. He would just say all kinds of things about cell phones. It, it, any, but yeah, at any rate, uh, I dropped him off. You know, I, I it was like, I was going to leave because he just wasn't very engaging, but I knew he was sick. He wasn't feeling well. He got him in, and I parked the car, I go back in, and there's Harold with about three or four patients. Of course, he's the center of attention. You know, he did like being the center of attention. He did like making people laugh, and he could do that. He did like making them feel better. He's not talking about his situation. He's talking about them. He's finding out their life stories. He's finding about their ailments. He's finding about their treatment. Like my mother, he's finding about their kids. He's finding about their kids' friends. He really did engage with people, and individuals, let me say individuals, in a very genuine way. Those of you that knew him, and I'm stunned. People meet him, they, they say nice stuff. I may be the only person who doesn't. Uh, and I don't really say unnice, unkind stuff, just as he would say honest stuff. It was his, in his personality, it was his nature. I mean, if he talked to people, you could tell. You know, if you're ever in an art opening, right, there was Harold and Doreen, and there was a crowd. 
and he would make people laugh. He wanted to make them feel better. Now, one of the things we, and that was the story, one of the things we said and we wrote and Marcia said, you know, I've read my dad's journals. Like I said, this is to remind me I am not an artist. I am not an art critic. I don't really, I know something about his art, but I don't know much about art. But in his journals, I mean, one of the themes, and if you look at what's out there, you see those two, port the one portrait of my father in 50, early, probably the 40s, probably before I was born. You know, he did a lot of realistic portraiture. And, you know, you look through my, me and my Zisso, there are a lot of people that are posing with their portraits. And I think it's pretty easy to say, and you, know, you see these representational paintings, like the ones the temple has. You know, they are, and the one Bill, uh, bless you, you know, they're, recognizable people, and some are individuals, and I um, also have to point out to you, you see a lot of bright colors, there's also the one at the end, which is, you know, a little disturbing. Um, you know, that, what, what he said about the Holocaust, that did stick with him. He, uh, you know, he, he thought about those kinds of things too much. He painted portraits, and then what happened was, you know, he shifted, um, and things became increasingly abstract, uh, and there's some paintings out there that are just color field, and, and I don't understand technically what's going on, but I know what my dad said about it. And this goes back to what I said about his personality, his nature. So now I get to read the quotes. If you're ever at one of his lectures, he just read quotes of other people. He never said anything about his art. This time I get to talk about his art. And as I said, I've gotten these questions from people. I hope they're of some help to you. I know that you know this work, is. some people really love it. Some people aren't sure. Some people just don't like it. I go through those moods all the time. There's a lot of stuff up in our house, and sometimes I feel the same way about some paintings. You know, there are days I really dig them, and days I just, they're too ugly, they're too difficult, they're too dense, they're too... Uh, and, and this is Harold speaking, all right? For the, the painting and drawing I do is a way of searching, of finding, of knowing, of mourning, of crying, of laughing, of feeling, of being, and of communicating. That's sort of a generalized thing. Uh, yeah, here's one. Um, what did he do, uh, technically? I started with what was largely a descriptive process, dealing with something that was comprehensible out there to something that was happening in my mind through a kind of imaginative projection, closing off the out there to what was actually inside, something interior. I think one of his expressions was discovery through imagination. And what's going on with the art, I think, you know, it's fair to say, and some of the people I know, recognize here know a whole lot more about art and a whole lot more about Harold and Harold's art than I do. But you know, that's what happens. It's imagination. It, you know, it kind of opens up, to open up the mind, you know, open up your vision. Oh, that's the feeling I have. So, how does it work, huh? There's a wonderful video that uh, Mike Beatty uh, from this community did that's posted. It's one of the few times my dad talks about his art. I watched it. I'm just gonna read something, transcription. I don't do any pre-planning. It's all improvisational. If you know my father, that makes sense. And obviously, it's layers of gesture. I have material that I keep on one side, he, his easel, which is at the South Bend Museum, and I, I've seen him do this. He would, easels here, you keep stuff, you put a photo here, you look at the photo, this is what he says. You look at the photo and you turn his head and you freehand it. I, I, this is what he says he did. Um, and I let my hand just move through a path that picks up the essence of the thing, uh, uh, of what I'm looking at thing I'm looking at, it doesn't duplicate it. And this is about his later work, primarily. This is the work uh, mostly after that retrospective. And we have the catalog here. I strongly recommend you take a look at the catalog and the descriptions of his work in there by uh, my sister, Beverly, who actually did have a degree in art history and did write about art, not just my father, and, and a woman named Judy Oberhausen. And uh, you know, it was published, so that means Harold was OK with it. Um, game back, oil crayons. And, and then he says, I also work with my left hand because my right hand is too finesse. Harold could draw. If you look at some of those portraits out there, I mean, he could do portraits. I mean, portraits of people in the community, they're just stunning. Um, I also might, might also work with my eyes closed because you get a better feeling. And all, I, I work all over it, and then I get certain patterns, and I start to exploit. So in these sketchbooks, and there are some pieces up, um, I think some of the Sarnot pieces are good examples, or some back there. Those all started from a figure drawing class. Like on Thursday nights in the mid 80s, he'd go to this figure drawing class and we all know, you know, my dad liked to draw pictures of the models. And, and there were other things, there were portraits and faces and he filled, you know, maybe half, two thirds of those 110 sketchbooks started that way. 
And then he would go back and add color. Uh, and it was sort of a similar process uh, that he used. So that's a little enigmatic. I got a few more things here, folks, if that's all right, um, that he said. So and this will maybe I hope tie it together, Bill's description, my description, what Judy wrote. For Harold Zisla, art has become a way of life. Over the years, the accumulated experiences gained through his research, reading, and relationships with others have lent a richness and meaning to his art, which, from its roots in Cubism, has evolved throughout his career into a complex, colorful weave of multi-referential images. Yeah, you look at it, and ah, I see a face in there. Yeah, it's a good start, some of this stuff, because you're going to, especially the later stuff, you're going to see more than one. I think people, you'll see more than one face and more than one object. And you're, I see things in it that I don't know what they are, but they're, they're not faces. There's something going on. I don't know, and maybe a couple of people here can explain how he did it, but he did that. These works display an explosive energy, and this was written in the mid-'80s, signaling the artist's newfound confidence as he tread into unfamiliar territory, getting away from portraiture to abstraction, abandoning conventional notions of taste and beauty. You know, some of the stuff isn't pretty. I mean, uh, Zissel produced raw, powerful, abstract images, which mirrored the private interior world of the artist. That was in the mid-'80s. And a lot of what you look, I think almost everything back there is after that period. So whatever's going on before that, of those thousands of pieces we described, the real explosion happened in the mid-'80s. I mean, he found something, and he became freer. He got away from abstraction, purely abstract. And what comes back, well, look at the later pieces. There's a face. There's a head. One seed, and this is my sister again, and then and she's a Zissel, so I can quote her. One sees concrete images which flicker in and out. One gets the general sensation of restless movement across the surface, which itself it fluctuates between landscape and mindscape. Still life and a metaphor for growth, face, and mythic human forms. So what does he say? And I'll, I'll um, here's some words he used. Complexity, mystery, ambiguity. Huh? And he was experimenting with yeah, stuff that didn't have, yeah, just there's some pieces out in the hall, they're just color fields. They look almost uh, just two notes. Also, and this is in 92, I am returning to my roots of portraiture, or rather my interest in the human condition as expressed through characters in, character in heads. Um, he says in 92, I am a person painter. And I think this is okay to quote. Uh, the difference between de Kooning and Pollock, monumental. De Kooning was oriented to women. Pollock to himself. Me, my father, not me, to portraits. You know, that's what it was about. So Bill and I talked about his relationship with people. And if, you know, when I went to Martin's, what would happen to me is people would say, ah, oh, you're Harold Zisla's kid. And I wouldn't say a word before they did that. And they'd, say, they'd look at my face or something. Ah, oh, you must be Harold's kid. He would talk to those people. And my mother, too. I mean, she called people to get her airline reservation or something straightened out, you know, 15 minutes later, she could tell you all about them, you know, just their whole life. And, and they opened up to her. And if you ever sat with her, you may have had that same feeling. OK, what does Harold say? If, and this was his standard. You don't have to buy into it, right? I mean, some of the stuff, you, this doesn't work. But here's what he was about. And maybe, you know, if you spend some time with this work, it'll start to make more sense. If a work does not entice mystery, doubt, enigma, uncertainty, it can't be art. There is no such thing as finality or completeness. Uh, someone made the comment, Marsha, you know, there's a really wonderful explosive color. I mean, that was a side of my father. I mean, he, you know, that, inner, that was genuine. I mean, he really, you know, it wasn't all darkness. It wasn't all death heads. It wasn't all fixation on the Holocaust. But there's some other pieces that are, you know, they're kind of, I don't like to look at them at night when there aren't many lights on in our house. I mean, then they bother me. I, I got it. I got one last thing, Moshe. Okay, Moshe, I got to read one last thing. If it's okay, I, I'm getting a, a few nods. So, do we do we want to vote? No. Let me just read. The, let me read this last quote, and I will wrap it up. Thank you, Moshe. Um, so here, I want to read one quote from Harold, just one, which is a foundation for when I invited people uh, to this show with the statement that they should view the art and experience a bit of Harold. Right. His work is recognizable as his work. I mean, it's, it's his. And whether that's these panels or the drawings back there or the portraits of people or that little book we did called Port <coughs> Provocative Lines, that's Harold. 
in the line drawing he did that shows his nose. It's just one line. Yeah, it's his nose. It's a, as his ENT said, it's a pretty magnificent nose. But it, it's also the line is Harold. So here's what he said. You ready? Um, and I'll, I'll drop another story I kind of like. But can anyone use my method? Of course, but with totally different results because of the differences, difference in the psyches and the complexity of the process affording myriads of choices, deliberate or otherwise. Each hand is different. It will show. Each demon possessing each of us is different. It will show. Each capacity to choose, select, or consciously manipulate will show. Somehow or other, and I don't know how he did it, but you know, this is Harold's work. It's multi-layered. It's energetic. What I want to do, you know, wrap it up, is if you have pieces at home, spend some time with them. Just look at them. You know? Some days are great. Some days, not so much. You'll see different stuff. Um, and just experience the work. As he said in a longer quote, it's meditative. You know, it's for quiet. Uh, and so, you know, with that, I, uh, thank you, you know, uh, a lot for showing up. Thank you for the, the Federation, the museum, uh, IU, the Gitlins. I, their walls must be really a lot different now. Uh, Barb Asher, and Char who are not here. Uh, Steve McTeague, my dad's ENT, as I mentioned. One of the wonderful pieces out there is his. D you know, thank you for being here. Um, it's great to meet some people who knew my dad. You all have your perspective. I hope I didn't ruin your understanding of him. I hope, it, to some extent, tiny measure, we helped, you know, you get a sense of him in the work. Um, some in his own words, in the piece, I recommend the accumulations book. I should say, in terms of the art, people have asked me. The pieces in back, they are marked. Uh, as my mother said, we support Temple. If you're so inclined, you know, you want one, if you don't already have a whole bunch, you know, uh, talk to Moshe about maybe buying one. And um, what we're going to do is, you know, we do need some money to support those thousands and thousands and thousands. Oh, my father. Thousands of pieces we have in storage, but, you know, there's some costs. But, like, we'd like to, you know, split the proceeds if there are any with the Federation. And if you're so inclined to add on to that, please do. Uh, as my mother said, it's an important thing in the community. It matters. That Jewish identity matters. If you can help support it, we can help support it. Great. So I've gone, I, I gather I've gone a little long, um, and I could keep going, as anybody in my family knows. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and we'll be around talking and visiting. Thank you. Everybody.